ADHD Rewired, episode 437. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host, and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection, and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter, you can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups, learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups, you can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. We are here for a live monthly Q&A. It is June 14th, and we have joining us today, Will Kerb, the host of Hacking Your ADHD. What's going on, Will? Not much. Glad to be here. And we have Brendan Mahan, the host of ADHD Essentials. Hi, everybody. And we have Coach Kristen Martz. Hey, everybody. And one of our other coaches, Coach Kat Hoyer. How you doing, Kat? Finer than frog hair split three ways. (laughs) (laughs) And now we're all better hearing that. And we have Lisa Cisla, ADHD Rewired, fantastic assistant, community manager, and uh, honorary neurotypical. But she's not typical. She's a little weird. I'm just just going to let you all know. And we love her for it. Not typical at all. All right. Well, our main star for this moment is Deborah, who has a question for us. Deborah, what's your question? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, holding this uh, forum and giving us the opportunity to get some ideas and help. So my question is in regarding to managing social media. I'm trying to build a business. I am on Instagram and Facebook. I just, uh, but I'm in a number of groups on Facebook communities. And part of what I do is, you know, I have to be visible and I have to be participative all the time. I find it overwhelming. Like I end up being scattershot. And somebody said to me yesterday, oh, you know, I created a spreadsheet. And of course, every time I hear the word spreadsheet, it's like, what? How do do I do that? Or I can do it, but I don't even know how to like manage it. And that doesn't help me. Just it's just a list within boxes as far as I'm concerned. So I was wondering if you any of you had any tips, ideas, tricks, possibly apps to help manage specifically, you know, manage all of those balls that are, have to be kept up in the air. Thank you. Are you, um, what is the specific area that you're looking for help with managing on social media? Is it the like responding and engaging or posting on a regular basis? Responding and engaging and keeping track. Yes. Okay. Um, like for instance, you know, I, if I'm in, a, a, as I said, a number of different communities and before I can have my ask, you know, and kind of promote myself, I have to develop relationships. Mm-hmm. That means you have to be present and comment and whatever. And I just, it's incredibly time consuming. Gets, as I said, to be scattershot, like, oh, I'll be here now, here now, here, without any, you know, rhyme or reason or um, plan. Okay, so you're going in and just kind of like whenever you either feel like it or you get a notification that like sort of cues you. But uh, so it sounds like the, the yeah, cues are, are sort of happenstance. Okay. Will and Brendan both have some thoughts for you. Will, go ahead. So I'm really bad with social media for uh, my podcast. I don't do really any promotion because as much as it seems like it would help, it never has really. And part of that is that you have to put in a lot of time to be the top of the grouping on social media because the the uh, whoever has the biggest presence is going to get most of the spoils. And so doing just a little bit of social media doesn't really tend to help because you're just not going to be engaging with people. And so the question that you always have to ask yourself, could I be using my time that I'm using to like do this marketing for something that would be better and more uh, impactful for what I'm trying to do. And so that's what I kind of have ended up doing with my social media presence being like, 
I'll do some stuff for what I want to do for my own enjoyment, but not for anything for trying to build my brand because it really is never going to get to a place where I have the time to do it by myself. I'd have to hire someone else to have that kind of impact. Brendan? Uh, don't, don't, don't make a spreadsheet. Don't, don't make it to do list. That's not a thing that is going to necessarily do what you want to do instead. And this might be what the person meant by make a spreadsheet, but schedule it. Like on Monday, I go to Instagram or every day at three o'clock, I go to Instagram or whatever it is that however you want to do it. Right. Cause that way you're going there and go there with a purpose too. And that purpose might be, I'm going to reply to people or that purpose might be like, if you're doing it every day, maybe each day has a theme, right? Like it's mindful Monday and I don't know, reflective Thursday or something, but have that kind of a vibe for it. Like, cause that's how you get consistency is you schedule stuff. And the other point that I, that I want, I want to piggyback on what Will said, because yes, right. Like the sheer amount of effort that is necessary to, to have the social media drive your marketing stuff is intense, but social media is a good place to connect to other human beings. So if you're doing social media anyway, pick a handful of people that you want to regularly engage with and regularly engage with them until you don't have to regularly engage with them anymore. Cause now you can engage with them like periodically and it works. Right. But be strategic about who those people are and make sure you're giving as good as you're getting. Right. So like provide them with opportunities first. Yes. Don't expect them to provide you with anything just do what you can to provide them with opportunities or ideas or articles that you've read that might be helpful or whatever. And then maybe it comes back around, maybe it doesn't, but hopefully you're creating a relationship so that eventually you can make an ask if you need something. Don't make the ask right away. And oh my God, don't do it on LinkedIn because people hate that. I know because I've posted things about how much I hate that. And they're the most popular things I've posted on LinkedIn. <laughs> That's excellent. Excellent, Brandon. Thank you so much. And I'm assuming schedule, which scheduling app do you all like? Do you like Trello? Google Calendar. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay. I'm basic. Yeah. And, you know, and for, as far as posting goes, there's keeping all kinds. Co- more keeping it in one place I know mm-hmm. is, is pretty critical. And I'm still, I think last time I was on, I was complaining about the fact that I can't completely sync my Google Calendar and my Apple Calendar because some apps will automatically, you know, they don't give you necessarily a choice. And so they'll put it in one place or the other, but yeah, that's still my, my ax to grind, but thank you so much. Awesome. And I know that uh, um, I think apps like Hootsuite can also help you sort of uh, have like a dashboard that can help you see all of your activity, I think in different places on social media. So that's another kind of tool to to look at. Kat, if you want to add something to that, and then we have another question. Uh, Yeah, I, not a fan of social media. I've actually boycotted it as a business owner just because it took more time and energy than what it was worth for me. But I will say, you know, ditto on what both uh, Will and Brendan said. I would also uh, say that autoresponder is your friend. So using autoresponders to um, let people know, you know, I'm checking or here's another way to get back with me. And then creating your own content versus trying to engage in other people's content because sometimes social media can be a form of procrastination versus us taking action. It feels busy, but it's not always. Good thoughts. All right, uh, Danielle, we got you up next here. Can you uh, share with us what your question is? Um, Yeah, um, I'm kind of trying to develop a library of scripts that I can pull from for responding to common things because I tend to struggle with articulating myself. And that's where a lot of my procrastination comes from is I say, oh, okay, I need to think about how I'm going to respond to this. And it gets put off. Um, In a previous career, I was in real estate and we had scripts for everything. (laughs) And I was like, I need something like that for, you know, my current business and, you know, just common things. So you're looking for uh, uh, tools that will help with either creating the scripts or making it easier to actually uh, use the scripts you've created? Um, more creating some common scripts. So common responses and things because I, you know, I tend to, you know, not even respond to social media because I feel like, you know, I'm saying the same thing every time to every comment. Don't know how to kind of personalize it just a smidge. You know, same thing with emails. 
So first of all, I want to acknowledge that that what you just described doing is such a smart thing to do. You know, it's how often I, I hear people and see people reinventing the wheel over and over again. And it is absolutely worth the time it takes to build those scripts and those templates because the thing that will maybe at one point takes you 15 to 20 minutes, you can respond in one, right? Because you've already actually done the heavy lifting ahead of time. So exactly. um, there is a program called Text Expander, which I'm a huge fan of, that you can program all kinds of sort of like shortcut snippets and then have it really easily populate the responses. But two things on this. I think that, you know, because it's hard for us as people with ADHD to sometimes, you know, see point A to point Z, that building systems often work best when we build the system while we're actually responding to something. Right. Mm -hmm. So instead of like trying to build a system sort of in isolation, like every time you're, you're responding to a new post or a, a new email or something like that, you are also adding that response to your actual uh, system of, of responses. The oh, other thing yes. you might want to look at is going through different you know, areas in social media. And if you see like a community manager that like does a really good job of, of responding and commenting on people's stuff, you know, see how they respond. Right. Right. And then yeah. like the ones that feel like, oh, I could see myself saying that. Right. Like borrow those ideas. Right. Yeah. Because I'm like, I wish there was like a drop down menu, you know, you know well, like I could just pick. <laughs> and then, you uh, text response. expander. You can do that with text expander. You can create drop down menus. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> Kristen. That's amazing. Hi, Danielle. Um, Hi. I think I was, um, <laughs> it's good to meet you, your nice. voice. Um, I think I was sort of uh, kind of sinking into a piece of what could be part of what you were asking, because this happens to me, is I think you said something like, when I'm not sure what I want to say, and I'm one of those people in the camps of, I cannot, I just hate it when people do not respond to an email and come to find out it's because they didn't know what to say. So me being on that, the other end of it too, yeah. when I don't know what to say, I have begun um, probably in the past few years to give myself permission to say, hmm, I'm processing that. I need to think on that. Um, I don't know how well that necessarily works with social media pieces, but maybe the idea of some of the scripting being giving you a pause could be useful too. And then, you know, kind of clicking into what Eric said, then once you found that answer, then starting to build that. I work with a lot of people with anxiety and that's one of the, the greatest gifts that I can help teach them and that they can earn for themselves is to learn what to say to give themselves a pause, even when they're just making business calls to turn on their water or their electricity or have to call a post office and things like that. So I, I think, you know, um, let me think about that. Um, I'm checking my calendar. I remember there was a meeting. I'm going to come back and add to this post when I when I find that so I can give you more details. Things like that, um, I hope may be helpful. You're right. That is part of it too, um, is needing that time to process. <laughs> I, I also process sometimes struggle well. with, with knowing what to say in a response. And I'll tell you one of the things I do more of, like Bitmoji, a few Bitmoji that can like, I think sometimes okay. that is like even better than an actual like written response because it's also fun. I, yeah, Eric, I'm a huge fan of that too. And it's it's very fun and it shows more engagement, especially when you're asking them to hold for a minute and to pause and wait for it. Kind of the wait for it answer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like that idea. That's a good idea. <laughs> Brenda? I'm, I, I don't know, links in the show notes, but I threw three links into the chat. One is a life hacker article about how to say like templates for emails to say no that I threw in my, my community a little like two days ago. I also put a link to a book called how to say it, which yeah. is kind of more lettery oriented, but like just take pieces of it and I'm sure it'll work. Yeah. Um, and then I also linked to Renee Brooks's uh, guard your yes ebook. Cause some of what's nice. coming up right now is like how to say no. And that right. you gotta go, you gotta guard your yes. Um, in terms of the script stuff you're asking for, like that's, that's that stuff um, that I just mentioned. But another component to this potentially, feel free to tell me that I'm digging too deep, is not, not, not necessarily knowing what to say, but not being sure about how you feel about it and not really being sure where this is going to lead. I know for me with emails, that is a trip up for me when I, when my life is chaotic and crazy, either because 
stuff's going on at home or I have a ton of business stuff happening, I'll get an email and I'm like, this email just feels like more work for me. It just feels like more stuff that I have to do. And I don't even know what that work is yet because this email is vague and they're not getting straight to the point about what they want. They're just like, hi, how are you? Nothing. Right. So I would play around with that as well. Like wonder is some of this that like there's an emotional component undermining your ability to figure out what you want to say, because maybe you don't feel know how you feel about it. Or maybe you do know how you feel about it and how you feel about it is negative. You're like, this is a terrible idea and I don't want to do this, but also I feel guilty about that. And I feel like I should do this thing, respond to this person, smile like I enjoy this when in fact it's terrible and horrific. (laughs) Like just know that stuff and be prepared for what to do with it. And then the ultimate script that I want to give to you is I'm not sure. Let me get back to you. I have to figure some things out and then don't. Don't get back to them (laughs) because if it really matters to them, they will get back to you. Their problem is not your problem. I I think that's a great place to uh, take a break, but we actually will get back to you after this break. (laughs) All right. That was, uh, I like that, Brendan. (laughs) Support for ADHD Rewired comes from ARC. ARC is ADHD Rewired Coaching. Since 2014, our award-winning coaching and accountability groups have proudly served 900 adults with ADHD just like you. We believe in growth through community. Every season, our goal is to empower members to get curious, to ask better questions, and to live a more productive and wholehearted life with ADHD. We're getting a jump start and a registration for our fall coaching season, which begins September 30th. Last week, I told you that you're going to want to get on our coaching group interest list early. Why? Because the earlier you register, the more you can save. Join our registration kickoff event on Friday, July 22nd and save up to $500. Join July 28th, you can save $400. August 4th, $300. August 11th, $200. August 18th, $100. And on or after August 25th, you'll be paying full price. Go to coachingrewired.com to see details and most importantly, to get on our fall interest list. You can't join us this fall if you don't get invited and you can't get invited if you're not on our list. So if you want to create to-do lists that make sense to you, set up cues to remember those to-dos that complement your ADHD brain, hone in on your routines while building in self-care into your calendar, then join us and other adults who understand what it's like to live with ADHD. If there's one thing we can promise at the end of the 10 weeks, it's that we'll all still have ADHD. But that doesn't mean that the support stops there because the maintenance is next level shit. We've had hundreds of adults with ADHD go through our coaching groups. So at the end of 10 weeks, you won't have to continue on your journey with your ADHD alone because this community of growth minded people who also understand what it's like to live with ADHD will be there with you. Go to coachingrewire.com and click on the yellow button at the top of the page to get your name added to our fall interest list. Even if you've signed up to be on our interest list for a previous season, come back to coachingrewired.com so you can stay in the loop for all of our fall registration kickoff event information. That's coachingrewired.com. One more time, that's coachingrewired.com. Happening today, if you are listening to this episode early enough on the day it came out, you are invited to join us for our monthly live Q&A. That's today, July 12th at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Every month, I am joined by an amazing team, including Brendan Mahan of ADHD Essentials, Will Kerb of Hacking Your ADHD, MJ Siemens with ADHD Diversified, and our coaches, Kat Hoyer and Kristen Martz. You can find out more about all of our shows on the ADHD Rewire podcast network by going to adhdrewired.com and clicking on podcast and select podcast network at the top of the page. So go to adhdrewired.com slash events so you can join us and register for our live Q&A and ask me or any of us questions.
questions about your ADHD. And if you enjoy and find value in this show, please consider leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other podcast player that accepts reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe or follow in your favorite podcast player so you don't miss out on shows that come out every week. Whether you've been listening for a while or are joining us for the very first time, thank you for taking the time to listen. And if you're listening to this early enough, join us for our live Q&A. Discover more from ADHD Rewired by going to ADHDrewired.com. That's ADHDrewired.com. And we're back. All right. I think it's the first time we've had one of our uh, people asking a question who gave us just a lovely transition back into the podcast. So, Kayla, what is your question? So, my question is, what advice would you give to somebody who's trying to figure out what to do with their life? I recently stepped away from college because I thought I knew what I wanted to do. I've changed my major so many times. I don't feel confident. I just feel like I'm going into debt and don't have an end goal. But I've been on this mental health journey, which I actually started from listening to your podcast. And so I've kind of been trying to figure out what it means to be authentically me. I've been constantly getting the question is like, what are you doing? Like, what are your plans? And I feel like telling people like, um, well, I just plan on figuring out what it means to be me doesn't really give people the answer they're looking for. And so I have all this pressure to like figure out what's next. And I feel so overwhelmed by the weight of that, that I feel like I don't even know what my potential is. I kind of just feel really stuck right now. And I'm trying to be okay with that, but I don't know how to find that guidance or that push that's going to like get my mind going to figuring out what is next. Okay. If you can remove all like say financial constraints, time constraints. What do you love doing? I love working with kids and I love working with people. I would love to start my own podcast, but I don't know how to do that. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, I'd love to write a book. <laughs> okay. And okay. So you, you love working with kids and what, yeah. what's, what specifically? Um, I'm super into psychology. So I really would love to help kids that struggle. I struggled a lot as a kid and help them just be confident in being themselves. Kind of just want to be that person that I needed as a kid for Mm. other kids. I've always had that calling, but it does not really pay well. I have tried a few jobs in that position, but I haven't figured out exactly what job would make that good for me. Okay, so uh, you said you've tried a couple majors. Um, what what have you tried that is in that realm? Um, so I did get my associates in early childhood education, and okay. I did teach preschool for a few months, and very quickly got burnt out and traumatized, and decided that teaching was not for me because it was just too too much emotional stress that I had not learned the tools how to deal with yet. And how long ago was that? Um, it's been a year since I left that job. Okay. So you you enjoy working with kids. Are there any things that you've been passionate about through your life? Hmm. I did dance when I was younger and I was very passionate about that. So I'm going to ask one of our coaches here, Kristen Martz, who is not only a a, a therapist and works with kids, is also a dance instructor. So Krista, what what are your thoughts for Kayla? Well, my first question is always, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Uh, I wanted to be a surgeon. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be like this badass superhero. But my first term of college, I totally flunked out of calculus and chemistry. And it was so hard that I was like, I'm not smart enough for this. So I changed my mind immediately. (laughs) Kalia, were we split at birth? (laughs) (laughs) I'm not kidding. That is that is one of the biggest things I wanted to be when I was growing up was um, and it has a piece behind it, though, of wanting to to help my mom. Uh, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon and she has a condition called syringomyelia that the cysts, uh, the tumors are entwined in the nerve pocket mm-hmm. and they couldn't remove it. Yeah. So that got me all interested in that. And the same thing, too much trouble with the chemistry, even though I was smart enough, it, the ADHD is what I later learned later, later, later in life is what got in the way. And yes. for me with the teaching, I wonder if you could analyze some of the pieces of the teaching. What about the teaching or being in the preschool? I know you said it was emotionally impactful, but I'm wondering what was the um, 
kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back of that, that created the emotional impact? Was it that you had too many kids at once? Was it that you felt trapped in a one space all day? When you talk about wanting to help kids and be impactful, a lot of times it's either you're good in the group and that is where your, you know, your gift is, or it's that one-on-one or smaller group, or maybe it's gender based or age based. Maybe it's a different age that that's, is in sync with you more in your personality. Have, have you done any assessment on that piece of it from the yes. experience you had? So from my experience, I learned I don't want to be in a large group. I cannot take on the stress of too many children at once because I do care so deeply about their emotions as individuals and not being able to meet those emotional needs as just one person was like so much. So I do enjoy one-on-one. And so when you're teaching, it's not always about teaching the emotional component. So what are some jobs that would kind of steer you in that direction? I'm thinking, you know, guidance counseling in the world of therapy, even I wonder if there are nonprofits out there, like I see in St. Louis all the time, Girls on the Run, do they have jobs like that? Um, Or the Girl Scouts or those kind of things. I'm wondering if you kind of broaden your scope of where you're looking and guide it to, obviously, it's the emotional component that you want to create positive impact toward, if you could find something that way. Those are good thoughts. I haven't, I haven't looked more into it because that situation was so emotional that I'm just never going to do this again. But I've been not feeling so great about that decision. I will have to look into what's around my area. Okay. And just to pull the dance component in, um, you were passionate about your dance. Was that strictly for you, like yourself, or do you enjoy being in that environment? Would teaching be an option there for you? Ooh, I've got to go learn how to be a dancer again. It's been quite some time since I've practiced those skills. But for me, I think it was just a way to express myself and to move my body. And it just felt good. Like I felt, I felt good about myself. Like I was good at something. Well, maybe looking in that area, you wouldn't necessarily have to be a dance teacher to be around that and create positive impacts with dancers and dance students and, you know, youth in the arts. There may be some other avenues with that. And Kayla, did you share with us, uh, when were you diagnosed with ADHD? Um, I I was diagnosed in 2019. Okay. So... I would imagine that after you got that diagnosis, you maybe didn't jump into learning all the skills and strategies that might help you. Oh, no, I did because I was like, I have something wrong with me. I'm going to fix it. Therapy. I'm going to go to therapy. I'm going to get the answers and I'm going to be good. And I went to therapy and she's like, let's talk about trauma. And now I've been in therapy for like two years and I'm still going. I did not know it was going to be like a a journey. I thought it was going to be like medicine. You just, you go and you're done and you get fixed and you're all better. (laughs) And that's not what happens. That is not what happens. And I think some of the best therapies and some of the best uh, coaching, um, what you actually work on is often different than what you thought you were going to be work on because we are complex human beings and the more layers of the onion we peel away of, you know, just want to kind of uh, encourage you to consider again, you know, I know you mentioned at the start of your question that you would love to join one of our coaching groups. It really, I know, I think Brendan once said this because Brendan was a, he, he was an OG in our, in our coaching groups. And I remember uh, him once saying that like, if you want to fast track, all you can learn about ADHD. So you can either spend a year reading all the books or spend 10 weeks in our coaching groups. So something to, yes. to consider if, if you're able to. Brendan? Um, I have so many thoughts. <laughs> one, you're right. Working with kids, especially if you don't have at least a bachelor degree, if not advanced degrees, it does not pay well. It just doesn't. And in fact, even a bachelor's degree, in order to get it to pay well, you still have to get a master's. Yeah, at least. So that's just so you know. That said, you've already gotten associates. So you've proven that you can do school. But you said like, I don't know what I want to do with the school. Sounds like you kind of do. It sounds like what you want to do with the school is help kids. And I would, if I can be a little bit of a rebel... Uh, if you dabbled in psychology in undergrad, don't major in something else if you decide to go back to school because undergrad psych doesn't do what you want to do. Master's degree, graduate level psych does what you want to do. Undergrad psych is history. It's the history of psychology. And that's pretty much all that it is. So major in like sociology or actual Social history, work. even like English something that's going to get you to understand people without having to nail, without having to do it in psychology. 
And then you can still get a graduate degree in psychology with a different undergrad. I know because I did that. Um, I designed my own major and it was called creative writing. And a third of my credits were in comic books and they still took me into a psychology program. So, or an educational psychology program. So I just want to let you know that that's, that's the road. And I wish there were alternate roads to get to there, but there really isn't. It's pretty much get a master's degree, spend some time in the trenches, getting an official license. Cause there's like probationary license stuff that happens. And then you can be like, sort of money. <laughs> Yay. Like it's at least like grown up money. If not, you're not going to, it's not Scrooge McDuck's money bin. So I, I just want to like frame it for you. The other thing I want to point out is uh, it's summer. And depending on where you live, school may or may not still be in session. Lots of summer camps need camp counselors and going and playing at camp with kids. And I almost literally mean playing like I sort of mean playing in terms of professional. What do I think about working with kids kind of stuff? But I also mean you're going to play kickball and tag and stuff um, as an old summer camp hand. Like I know what I'm talking about. That experience might help you recover, potentially, depending on what the trauma is, recover some of your, I actually do like to work with kids because there's not going to be as much drama. And if there is drama, it's not your job to deal with it. Like that's the camp directors. That's other people at camp will be handling the significant stuff. Or they'll, if it's a private camp, they'll just be like, sorry, your kid doesn't fit in this camp. And like, bye, that happens too. And it'll also give you a deeper understanding of kids and a bunch of different lenses and perspectives on them. Being a camp counselor was one of the best things I ever did to, for my skills camp. with children. So fun. Yeah. So I hope that was helpful for you, Kayla. Let's, uh, let's go on to another question. So Maria has a question, but I don't think she can go live here. She says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. And she asks, is that really true for persons with ADHD? The emotional reaction happens so fast and full. And then it seems there is no recovery. How do we create a space that might not be there? I really love this question. That power of the pause absolutely is something that we can train our brain to do. Will, what are your thoughts on this? We can practice. We can give ourselves fake situations to be like, okay, take a breath then react. And doing that practice seems really dumb at first because it's just, it feels like all the other conversations we have in our head where we don't ever have that actual conversation when when push comes to shove, but giving yourself to say, Hey, I know what I'm going to do in this situation is really helpful. And related to this uh, is also this idea of the hot, cold empathy gap, where it's really hard for us to interpret how we're going to react later So, you know, we go, and this is in retrospect too. So you have a situation where you got really angry and you're like, I don't know why I acted like that in the future. I'm not going to, you know, do this, say the same things thing happens again. You start yelling and you're like, I, how did I get here again? I, and it's because our brain is really bad at understanding how we are going to feel when we're feeling an emotion because we're only feeling what we're feeling right now. And so understanding this empathy gap makes it so that, oh, I'm not going to be able to just do something when I want to, if I'm in a high emotional state, I have to think through this beforehand and know what those responses I want to be are. That was a pretty great response there, Will. (laughs) That sounds like a well reason. Is there an an episode coming out soon about this? I had an episode a while back about the hot, cold empathy gap, but it's something um, I actually on my whiteboard back here, that entire diagram. Oh. It's the hot, cold empathy gap because I think it's such an important concept for ADHD because we have so many of those situations. Why did I do that? Well, next time I'll just do the right thing. And we don't over and over again. And it's because we can't interpret. Remember, it's like, I don't remember how it feels to be hungry when I'm not hungry. I don't remember how it feels to be bored when I'm not bored. Is it, we see it's kind of similar to the whole idea of like, we're planning our day in the morning and we give our two hour time block for the, our our side project at like 9 PM because that's the time that's available on the calendar, but we're scheduling this at 9 AM and we actually have energy. Yeah, exactly. It's just, we don't anticipate those. It's like, I'm not going to feel differently. I feel motivated right now. I'm going to feel motivated forever. Right. That bias to the now. Brendan. I want to expand the statement because that statement is not the complete truth. And I think that's why we have problems with this is the whole between stimulus and response. There is a space. That's not the only place the space is. And if we don't look at it as existing in other places, we feel terrible. 
right? And we don't learn how to move it to between stimulus and response because sometimes it's stimulants, response, and in the middle of my response, I have like a lucid moment, right? Where I'm like, I'm all upset and I'm like, or whatever. And then I have this thought of like, I am being the biggest jerk right now. And I have trouble pulling out of that moment because my ego gets in the way, right? Because my ego is like, no, you got to commit. Because if you pull out of this and say like, I'm really sorry for being a big jerk. Now you look like a chump and a jerk. And like that can't happen. I am too fragile of an ego, right? But if we can train ourselves to when we catch that, we can pull out and say, no, you know what? I am not behaving in the way that I want to behave. I'm not being the best version of myself right now. And I apologize for that. Please let me pull out of this. I need to take a break. I need your forgiveness. I need a drink of water. I need whatever I need to kind of recover. If we can pull out in the middle, awesome. Sometimes it's stimulus, response, and then space, right? That's when we have the stimulus, then we're like, rah, 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 rah. and then after we're like, I was a huge jerk just then. And that usually in that gap, we're able to do something with it. Apologize, just walk around shame faced wherever you are, ego wise. But if we recognize that that's the same space, it's just landing in different places, we can do more with backing it up so it gets to in between stimulus and response. If you're really cool, some of us sometimes can put the space before the stimulus. Right. Have you ever had someone like you're about to talk to someone and you're like, oh, they're going to do that thing that always flies me to the moon with rage and you know it's coming. And as a result, you can like prep for it or whatever because the stimulus hadn't happened. You just had a clue that it might show up and you're able to respond better because you're able to find the gap because, you know, the stimulus is coming. Really, this that gap happened before the stimulus just because you read that person in a way that was useful. So I reject the concept that it's stimulus gap response. It's stimulus response and the gap wanders all over the place in terms of where it lands chronologically and sequentially in that program. Awesome. Love that. You know, the other uh, thing to think about too is one of the, the real uh, values of mindfulness-based meditation is that it, it really strengthens your brain's ability to pause. You know, I'm, I'm a on again, off again meditator, um, but I'm, when, I'm, when I'm in a good meditation routine, that's one of the things I probably notice most is my ability to pause. And often it's the pause of when I'm about to avoid doing something that I know I need to be doing, right? I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. And then I just start doing it, right? And I, it's, it's a really, like it's small, but it's also profound at the same time because mindfulness meditation really, you know, the whole idea of mindfulness, it's about paying attention to that moment without judgment and just really noticing. And if we aren't noticing that, there's a, a stimulus that's triggering some response in us. If we're not aware of, oh, I'm noticing I'm feeling tense or I'm noticing a feeling of, of anxiety, right? Then how do we pause if we're not aware of our internal experience? Kristen? So that's where I was headed with that too, as Brendan was talking, is turning that gap into a pause. So the power of the pause. And then I reflected back, I think, on our first question with the power of scripting, with what Brendan was talking about. You get in the middle of it and you're like, oh, your ego's in the way. It can't get in the way if you if you develop a script for it with the, oh, wait, I'm not being the best per best version of myself that I, I can be. It, it will, I think it's about expectation of what do you expect is going to happen if you stop and show your vulnerability in the middle. A lot of times if you can practice that script, you can just throw it out there and be okay. You'll be ready for it rather than processing what can I say to make this sound right and not be so, sound so vulnerable or be the chump. If you have that script ready, all you have to do is kind of hang on for what's, what's the response from you delivering that script. And then you have more power over yourself doing that. It's very empowering, those scripts. Awesome. Well, let's take a, a quick power break. And uh, when we come back, I know that Brendan has to go in about eight minutes here. But before we let him go, we're going to uh, start our uh, after the break with a question about the wall of awful. So we will be right back. 
Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our virtual body doubling community, Adult Study Hall, at adultstudyhall.com. If you've been putting off cleaning out your fridge, getting started on your resume, decluttering a room, or organizing your paperwork, then join the online co-working community built for adults with ADHD by adults with ADHD at adultstudyhall.com. Access to Adult Study Hall is only $19.99 a month, and it's free for the first week. You can cancel anytime without any penalty. Your membership will give you access to Adult Study Hall 24-7 or ASH 24-7. This is our dedicated Zoom room that's open 24-7. You will also have access to Adult Study Hall Plus or ASH Plus. This is where you can work on decluttering, writing, creative projects, or your most dreaded tasks with some guided facilitation. And if you've been putting off your career change or anything career related, then join our very own Coach Kat Hoyer, her career accelerator session every week. Then I'll be hosting our monthly Pomodoro dance party on Thursday, July 21st at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. It's a great session to get your body moving and inject some fun into tasks that we might otherwise avoid doing. Dancing is required if your body and space allow. Dance skills are not. Join the virtual co-working community created just for us by going to adultstudyhall.com where you can jump into our 24-7 drop-in room or any of our facilitated sessions. It's free for the first week and only $19.99 a month after that. Give it a try and join other adults with ADHD who just get it. Come get some stuff done with us. The website again is adultstudyhall.com. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our patrons. And you can become a patron at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. You know, this is episode 437. Our entire backlog catalog is available to you. If you have been finding value in this podcast, if you've been finding strategies, connection, support, community, I want you to ask yourself, what is that worth to you? Sure, you can continue to listen for free or you can share with me or you can let me know that this podcast has brought value to your life and you can do so by becoming a patron. In addition to all the value you are already receiving at $5 a month, you can get ad free episodes. At $25 a month, you can join me for a monthly coaching call. At $10 a month, you can get the recording, the audio recording of that monthly coaching call. I know that costs for just about everything have been going up, so budgets might be a little tighter right now. But if you are in this situation where you can provide a couple bucks a month. I would really appreciate your support. You know, this podcast is not free to produce from editing costs to website hosting. And obviously, plus my time, we're looking at over $800 a month. Become a patron, show your support for this podcast, and know that your contribution is going to a good cause. That's ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks. All right, let's kind of jump right into this next question was the wall of awful question, somewhat a uh, question that wanted to go live. Nina, what is your question? So my question is, how do you get over the wall of awful about the wall of awful? This is some inception stuff right here. <laughs> um, so the wall of awful is the emotional impact of repeated failure that most often comes with ADHD, but comes with other stuff too, of course. Uh, it's a trauma model. And the idea is every time we fail, we get a brick in our wall. It's a failure brick. Along with the failure brick, we also get a guilt brick because I feel guilty because I messed up, right? I get a rejection brick or a shame brick, like just bricks, other bricks come, right? Like there's a whole lot of other negative emotions that come with a failure. And we don't just get those bricks for ourselves. We also get them from other people, right? Because if I get a disappointment brick because I failed, Someone else who might also be involved in that activity and that failure of mine, they might be disappointed in me too. And I'm going to assume that their disappointment is happening, whether it is or not, doesn't matter. It's how I, what I'm assuming is happening. So I also get a disappointment brick for them. When people disappoint us or when we disappoint people, we assume they're going to reject us. So we also get rejection bricks. It gets messy. It gets big pretty quick. That's the concept. When it comes to getting past it, there's five ways Two don't work. One works, but is unhealthy. And two work that are healthy. First one is staring at it. That doesn't do anything. You're not going to go anywhere. You're just staring at the wall. 
The second option is to go around it, but it's a metaphor and it's infinitely wide. I know because I made it up. You're not going around this wall. You're just not. The third option that works is to Hulk smash your way through, right? Like just get angry and be like, ah, fine, I'll do the dishes, God, or whatever the thing is. That's fight, flight, and freeze is what that is. That's that's our body's stress response. That's how we respond to stress, right? Fight is Hulk smash. Flight is go around it, whether it's physically moving or just, you know, watching TV instead of doing your homework or something. And freeze is freezing it, staring at it, not actually engaging at all with the task, not even enough to avoid it. The two ways that are healthy and get us past the wall, uh, but before I go there, you can Hulk smash inwardly and outwardly. Outward is yelling at the person who asked you to do the thing. Inwardly is, I suck. Why can't I just do this? What's wrong with me? That kind of self-flagellation stuff. Both of which can get emotional energy going to help us crash through this emotional barrier and do the thing that is in front of us that we want to do. The two that get us past it are climbing it, which is mostly sitting with the emotions and navigating them and hand dealing with them consciously or not, doesn't matter. Or putting a door in it, which is just changing our emotional state in the moment. The example I usually give for that is you want to exercise. You're like, I should go to the gym and you're not going to the gym. And then the eye of the tiger comes on the radio and suddenly you're rocky and you can't stop doing push-ups and running up steps and things. So that's, that's the wall of off in, in a very small nutshell. And I'm sure I missed stuff. A big piece of this, this is a climbing the wall strategy is acceptance, right? You already have awareness, Nina. You're like, I know this is happening. The next step after awareness is acceptance. Awareness is cognitive. Acceptance is emotional. You've got to be okay with what is happening. You're allowed to have a wall of awful. That's okay. You're allowed to struggle with whatever it is you struggle with, whatever that task may be. You might have it for email. You might have it for paying your bills. You might have it for interacting with your kid. As a parent coach, I have worked with parents who have walls of awful for talking to their kids or their spouse. It's okay to have that wall. And when you can accept that that wall is there, you're not going to have a wall of awful for that wall of awful anymore because you'll be like, oh, I, I'm allowed to, this is allowed to be hard. This is allowed to be difficult for me to engage with. Right now, what you're doing is you're going, this thing is difficult for me to engage with. And that means that there's something wrong with me and I'm a terrible person. And now I have a wall of awful for my wall of awful. That's a lot of emotional labor and a lot of cognitive work. I'm here as the expert in the wall of awful, literally, no one knows more about it than I do, to give you permission to have as many walls of awful as you need to have, you're allowed. It doesn't mean you never do those tasks. That's not a choice, but you're allowed to have trouble engaging with those tasks. And also for everyone listening, don't misinterpret a difficulty with activating with a difficulty with engaging because they're two different things right? Sometimes I have trouble activating for email or for editing my podcast, but that doesn't mean I have a wall of awful for those things. It just means that I'm having trouble activating. I do have a wall of awful for email because that is a thing that has emotional resonance with me and is challenging for me on occasion. I don't have a wall of awful for doing my podcast, despite the fact that it hasn't posted in over a month. That's because I got a lot of personal stuff going on. And after two plus years of posting weekly, everything blew up, but it's coming back soon. I promise. So the number one step is to just accept the fact that you have a wall of awful for whatever the task is. And then you'll probably find that the process of getting there is easier, but that that's a challenging thing to accept our limitations, to accept our weaknesses and flaws. That's hard. And and it requires a lot of thinking and potentially counseling and that kind of stuff. But that that's the number one thing. Other than that, lean in, right? Do the thing you're afraid of, climb into the rat's nest. Like you just, I'm not saying do the thing you have a wall of awful for. I'm saying climb the wall that you have the wall of awful for, like just engage with that wall and ignore this like secondary wall of awful for a wall of awful. It kind of reminds me of that sort of Buddhist philosophy of you can experience pain without having to suffer, right? Right. Pain is not optional. Suffering is right. And the suffering comes out from resistance from the pain. So right. as what Brendan is saying, if you can say, okay, I have this wall. This is what I'm struggling with, right? What You're are my allowed. options? That's okay. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just makes you a person. Everybody's got a wall of awful for something. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, I think the part about acceptance makes a lot of sense to me because I think even when I know there is a wall of awful, I'm not okay with it especially when it comes to computer emails, those kind of stuff, because I'm a software engineer and I don't like digital tools. 
And that's true. That concept is true for everybody who does anything in any field, right? I'm a parent coach and my kids are struggling right now. That's why the podcast hasn't posted in a month, right? I'm a parent coach. I am better at doing the thing that is the most hard for me right now than most people on the planet. And I don't want to know what would be going on for my kids if they didn't have me as a dad, because like it would be so much worse, but it's still hard because it's hard. Yeah. Sometimes stuff is hard because it's hard. Yeah. And even though you have an expertise in that area, software engineering is not Microsoft Word, right? Like it's, they're two different things. And it used to be that computer stuff was, if you knew computers, you knew computers, but the exponential growth of computer science and technology is ridiculous. It doesn't make sense that just because I code one thing, I know how to code everything and I know everything about computers now. Right? That's not how it works. All so right. Permission to not know. Yeah. It's all about permission. All right. Let's go to our next question. Lisa, do we have uh, everyone queued up here? All right. We got Heidi. Hi, Heidi. How are you? Good. How are you? Thanks for taking my call. Absolutely. What is your question? Um, I have spent so much time on productivity apps, getting into it, realizing it doesn't work for me. And I think that I heard it from you or Will that you were using Notion. So Will. I tried that out and loved it. I'm still struggling though to use it. I was wondering if you had any suggestions. You know, I want to just caution all of us when anytime we are saying, oh, I, you know, I was using this app, this tool, but it's not working for me anymore. This is not the tool. This is our desire to have a novelty. And so it's, I think it's really important that we understand that piece to it, that like our brain unfortunately gets bored. And when we think that, oh, I'll, if I'm excited about the new tool, I'll use the new tool. Well, if that's the approach you're going to take, fine. But then you're going to be changing tools every, you know, month or so. So really looking at doing the hard work of building the habit, right, through routines and setting up sort of environmental cues to make engaging in that routine as easy as possible. Because it's, you know, there is a certain element of work that is involved in maintaining and managing task management systems. All right, Will, what are some of your tips specifically about Notion? Uh, definitely piggyback off that, that it's us more than the tool. And especially with Notion, because it's so fun to use because it's incredibly customizable. You can make anything you want happen, basically. And super dangerous with ADHD because you can make anything happen. Uh, like, oh, I can, if I just spend another hour tinkering with this, it's going to be perfect. So first stop tinkering. And the most I've gotten out of Notion is when I started really just using what I have and then being go, okay, where are my friction points here? And trying to eliminate those friction points. And then really having the place you want to use it as your landing page for the day so that it's not something where you're just like, having to remember to go in. I do all of my episode writing in Notion, so I have to go in and use use it. And that makes it way easier to do because I have to use it. I've done some task managing in it sometimes. And if I it's, you know, it's if I'm not having to go there, I'm not going to. It's about making sure that you're not going to forget about it because something else is shiny. And so just kind of cutting down on friction points and making it a landing page. So Heidi, what, what are you wanting to use it for? Everything. <laughs> I want to take everything out of my head and have somewhere to put it in a way that makes sense to me. So I like the flexibility of it. It's, I feel like I'm missing like the, just some basic task management strategies. So Notion is great, but then like, how do I use the information that I put in there to figure out what I'm going to do today? Hi, um, Heidi, I don't know if, you, uh, if you're if you on our email list or ha having to catch, we just put out a, a five-part email series on uh, ways to, to engage in better planning. And one of the pieces of that is really being like thoughtful about the language that we use when we're adding items to our to-dos. Because it's almost humorous, if it wasn't so frustrating, that we can put something on our to-do list and we think we know exactly what it means because we're the ones that put it on the to-do list. And we're looking at these items that we keep pushing it off, pushing it off, pushing it off until we actually realize we actually have no idea what it is we need to do, right? So at the front end, spending a little bit more time and being more descriptive and clear as to what actually needs to happen can make it much easier to actually look at those, you know, look at your, your tasks and actually engage in them. Other things too, like are we confusing the difference between a task and a project? 
you know, projects right. are, are big. These, these take multiple hours where a task can typically be done in, I don't know, 45 minutes or less. That's sort of the framework that I typically use. There's so many of these sort of foundation, foundational uh, pieces to planning and task management. Like how many things could we get done in a day, right? It's like, it's way less than you think. Right? Especially if you have any difficulties with predicting how long things take. And I'm guessing that probably almost all of us listening to this, it's a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of practice going, huh, I think this is going to take 20 minutes. I mean, actually time how, how long it actually takes. Oh, wow. That took an hour and a half. That's weird. Right. And then we try that again. You're like, oh, so I think that when I think things are going to take 20 to 30 minutes, that takes me more like an hour to an hour and a half. We then learn that. Oh, so if I think it will take half an hour, then I'm going to multiply that by about three, and then I'm going to be closer to how long the thing actually takes. And by doing that, instead of putting the 10 items that you think are going to take you 10 minutes each, you know, you put the three to five items that you want to get done in that day because you actually have a better understanding of how long things actually take you. And this is a huge thing that we do in our coaching groups every single week is help people do the actual predicting and the tracking and because it's kind of boring to do. And so having that accountability to do it is really important, you know, and then for your day to day stuff, you know, I use Asana for most of my stuff, but like, you know, sometimes I'm just not looking at Asana. So I'll just grab a sticky note and that's my list for the day. Right. And so that's where I get my novelty from is by varying what it's looking for that particular day. Right. I have a template in a Google docs that I change each day, depending on how I feel um, for the, how I want to write out my day. Well, I'll just add on here. One of the great things with the Notion list too is you can have it so it will only show you a certain range of dates. So you can be like, I can only see tasks that are due in the next two days. And that will really cut down that giant list that we kind of create when we're doing that. Yeah, but then you have to assign dates and make a decision on Absolutely. when you're going to do it. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, and, and that's the thing. Doing that hard stuff up front makes everything easier down the line, right? And so maybe over the next couple of weeks, spend time just focusing on assigning dates and just know it's, you're predicting. Like you don't have to be right. You're making a guess and you're seeing how close you get. And then you're modifying and sort of tweaking okay. your predictions as you go, as you sort of hone in uh, and sort of fine tune your ability to assess how long things actually take and when you're going to actually get them done. Okay. I like that idea. Thank you. You bet. I'm reminded of the quote that you like to give that now I pass on and I won't get it exactly right. Something about Abraham Lincoln supposed to cut down a tree. He's got four hours. He's going to spend three hours sharpening the ax. It's, you get, you get totally you know, got the spirit of down. that quote. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> that saying that to myself often is very helpful when I'm kind of in the murkiness of why am I doing this setup? Cause I'm a plunger, you know, I like to just get to it. So yeah, that helps. All right. We are coming here at the end of the hour. So uh, I think we have a, uh, a moment of dad from Will Curb. Okay. So I've got two things for, for Pride Month going here. So first, uh, I just want to uh, identify as a gender, which is part of the non-binary grouping. Uh, just awesome. people who aren't, I got the any all pronouns now because I'm fine with anything. Uh, so to go along with that, how does a non-binary samurai defeat their enemies? How? They slash them. <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> That's great. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, beautiful. <laughs> was there, did you say there was one more? Uh, I do have another one that's far less appropriate if, you, if you're going game for it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> along with age Andrew, I'm also now identifying as Pan. And so, with that, I can say that I'm a walk. Because <laughs> I'm a big fucking Pan. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, congratulations and, and, uh, and welcome to the rainbow. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, my God. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um, so thank you everyone for coming, for asking uh, your, your questions and, uh, and for supporting us. All right, everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the day, week, month, and we will catch you back here next month, second Tuesday of the month. Thanks, everybody. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. 
We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons can join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tibbers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tibbers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers, reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.